I'm Lynn Smith, and welcome to Bigfoot Case Files. Become a channel member today to get access to some really cool perks. The link is in the video description. Three Sasquatch, 10 yards away. January 4th, 2012, Polk County, Florida. I've been hunting Green Swamp since the 1970s. Though I tend to hunt more than one wildlife management area each year, the Green Swamp is a go-to area for me. I have spent possibly a thousand days in the Green Swamp over the last 35 years. I'm very familiar with terrain and all of the plants, insects, and wildlife in the area. I have a demanding job that makes it difficult to coordinate a hunt with friends, so for the last 30 or so years, I have hunted alone. I have walked in and out of different hunt locations in the dark hundreds of times and have never seen or heard anything that alarmed me. In about 2010, a new tract of land was added and opened to hunters in Green Swamp. The tract is about a thousand acres of planted pines that are about 15 years old, trunks about 10 inches in diameter and clear of branches up to about 7 feet. The planted pines are about 15 feet apart and are planted in rows. Each row is also about 15 feet apart. There's a heavy layer of pine straw, so very little low vegetation is present. It is possible to see for hundreds of yards down each row, but visibility to each side across the rows is limited to about 50 yards. The pines are planted between natural cypress swamps and a few small ponds. Access is limited to foot traffic only, and there is only one way in and one way out. Hunting this area requires a lot of walking. I will often take a vacation in January and hunt for the better part of the week in the green swamp before the season closes. After the Christmas holidays, the woods are quiet with few, if any, hunters. During the week, it is not uncommon for there to be fewer than 10 hunters in the entire 55,000 acre wildlife management area. In mid-January of 2012, I had taken a vacation to hunt this area. This was my second year hunting the new area. It was midweek, there were no other vehicles parked at the entrance to this area. The weather was cool and clear. I was using a large garden cart of the type sold at Tractor Supply to haul in a heavy climbing tree stand that would also be used to haul out deer or hog if required. I had hunted the edge of the swamp that morning and at midday I decided to take down my stand and move to another location. I loaded up my cart and was pulling it along, rifle in hand, down one of the long rows of pines. I got to a location that the visibility down the row looking due west was exceptional, so I took a break, but was still actively hunting game that might cross this row. I set my backpack as a rifle rest and lay prone. My line of fire was west down the row. I'm in full camo with no face covering. My garden cart is an unnatural bright green with silver painted wheels with tree stand on top, probably about 40 inches in height overall. It was between 2 p.m. and 3 p.m., bright but indirect sunlight through the young pines. I had been there a few minutes and had been checking my work emails on my phone when I caught motion to my left. I looked up and there were three big dudes in black ghillie suits, no more than ten yards away from me, walking in single file, quartering away, crossing my line of fire. I laid there, surprised, but motionless, and let them pass. They walked in a north-northwest direction for about fifty to sixty yards into a cypress swamp, before I lost sight of them. Shortly after they walked out of sight, they started banging around in the swamp, loudly. The banging sounded almost metallic, a dull dunk, like hollow aluminum against a tree. I thought these idiots were very loudly and carelessly taking their tree stands down. There were possibly twenty bangs. I got frustrated that these guys had ruined my hunt and stood up, got situated and began to head west with my cart once again. As I crossed their path, I noticed a distinct game trail that they had used. I continued on and hunted that evening and the rest of the week in the area. I had my phone and camera in my hand while I watched them walk closely by. I had no fear or reason to take a picture or a video because it never crossed my mind that I was seeing anything but foolish hunters. They were walking rapidly but quietly. They walked fully upright with human posture and normal arm swing narrow at the waist and broad across the back. They appeared to be three physically fit, tall, young hunters in unusual black ghillie suits. They were big, but not alarmingly big. All three were identical size and shape, maybe six foot four to six foot six, 250 pounds. I did not notice an odor. 
Because they were quartering away, I did not see, or for that matter, even look for any facial features. Three big dudes in black ghillie suits, with no hunter orange, no rifles, no gear, walk directly in front of my loaded rifle, and me and my big ugly wagon are close, in the open, and in plain sight. I told my buddies at work about it. They suggested it might be Fish and Game Commission trying to catch poachers. For two years, something just didn't seem right about the whole incident. The more I thought about it, the more unanswered questions I had. They walked about ten yards from me, in very good light. Me and my wagon were very conspicuous. I was motionless, but how could a person, much less than three people, not see me out in this open terrain? They walked in front of another hunter with a loaded rifle. No hunter would do that. They had no gear, no vests, no hunting weapons. They were carrying nothing. If they were not hunting, were they hunters? Black ghillie suits. I have a green one and a tan one, but never worn either while hunting because they snag on everything. Why would someone wear a black ghillie suit in a green environment? If three hunters decided to hunt in ghillie suits, they would probably be green and would likely be different from one another. These were all exactly the same. Ghillie suits are usually and on purpose very asymmetrical, often baggy and droopy with rows of material sewn on. These were form-fitting and uniformly three or four inches in length. I would describe as looking like wet hair. The banging noise. About a year ago on a Saturday, I was watching river monsters, swamp people, and one of those Bigfoot shows. It dawned on me that the banging around might have been tree knocks. Until watching that show two years after the incident, I have never heard about tree knocks, so I had not previously made the connection. And that is when I began to wonder whether I had actually seen something other than hunters that day. After my incident, I was told that there had been a sighting of what was believed to be an adult and a juvenile by a cyclist the previous year. I found and read the report recently, and it sounds to be a couple of hundred yards from my sighting. Follow-up investigation report by BFRO investigator R. Monteith. I have spoken to the witness several times, and each time he is as detailed in the event as he was in filing his report. He spoke in the BFRO's Florida Town Hall event in 2017. He stated that the event always perplexed him because he just couldn't figure out why three men in black ghillie suits would be walking in a hunting area during hunting season without vests, weapons, backpacks, or gear. The three large figures walked with purpose or regard of possibly being in danger. When he watched a Bigfoot show on TV, he began to think that perhaps it was Bigfoots that he encountered that day walking in the woods. He had never considered this, but that made more sense to him than any other explanation he could think of. Military activity has been ruled out as safety is always important, and this would not occur in an active hunting area. Drug activity is always a possibility, but unlikely without weapons. The odd-colored black ghillie suits without vests would not work in either case, especially during daylight hours. The witness knows this occurred midweek in early January of 2012. The exact day is unknown. I have assigned January 4, 2012 for sorting purposes. The Green Swamp has many public reports of Bigfoot activity. In 2009, Florida BFRO were investigating reports of three black Bigfoots in the Green Swamp. Tracks of three individuals were found and cast. That investigation was not made public due to privacy reasons. Cyclist has sighting near Green Swamp. May 31, 2013 While bicycling on the Van Fleet Trail on the north end, I saw two humans cross the trail about 200 yards ahead of me. They were both dark brown from head to toe. The first was tall and quite big, well over six feet. The second was smaller and much lighter. Long arms and large head. They walked onto the tar trail, paused briefly to look at me coming, then ran off the trail. When I got to the spot they crossed, there was no trail to hike or run on and a very steep bank on the side they left on. It didn't take long to get to the spot, but they had completely gone out of sight. This trail goes through the green swamp, so there is not much around the area except swamp. It looked so much like Bigfoot's that I figured it must be a hoax. Hunter watches creature picking persimmons in the green swamp. November 1st, 2008. 
I went to a hunting spot to see what was happening just around the time the sun was getting low. I arrived at a spot that I knew had a persimmon tree to see if I could see any deer in the area. About 15 minutes after arriving, I noticed an animal standing up and getting persimmons and going back down to the ground about 75 yards away. I thought it was a bear. I watched it for about 20 minutes and was getting ready to leave because it was starting to get dark. Just as I was getting ready to stand up and leave, this animal did just that, stood up and left. I watched it get up on two legs and walk away. I observed this for at least 40 yards and it disappeared into the thick growth. Follow-up investigation report by BFRO investigator David Wright. This witness is an acquaintance of the investigator whom he called a few weeks after the incident. His delay was due to the significant reluctance on his part to be associated with such a startling experience. After conversing with the witness several times concerning his identity being secure with the BFRO, he was convinced to file a report. The official interview took place on December 31, 2008 and lasted about an hour. As stated, the witness is known by the investigator and his credibility is a known entity and was, is, discerned to be impeccable. The witness was asked to reiterate his account, which he did, and further information from the original report was gleaned in the interview process. That information is as follows. On one prior occasion during the previous turkey season, spring, this witness and another witness experienced what he described as a horrible guttural howl growl that lasted around five seconds. He stated that this sound was so terrifying that it resulted in two grown men and experienced hunters clicking their safeties off on their shotguns and getting the hell out of there. The observation took place at a distance of about 75 yards and lasted about 20 minutes. The observed creature repeatedly stood up, picked persimmons from the tree, and then went back to the ground with them. The witness, first thinking this was a bear, imagined that it was going to go back down on all fours. However, upon further questioning, came to the realization that the creature was actually squatting when it went back to the ground. The witness did not actually observe the creature actually putting persimmons to his mouth, presuming that is what he was doing when he went to the ground each time. As the witness was preparing to leave, he noticed the creature stand back up onto two legs and turn and walk from the witness right to left, where he watched him walk a distance of about 40 yards, perpendicular to his directive of view. During this time, the witness became completely perplexed by the fact that this couldn't be a bear at all, because bears don't walk upright, and this creature's entire exit was made bipedally without going to quadrupedal locomotion at all. The creature appeared to be 5 to 6 feet in height and appeared to weigh at least 200 plus pounds. The creature was described as being thick and stocky with more upper body than legs. The creature was seen entirely in profile, so the witness did not see a frontal or posterior silhouette. Ergo, could not estimate shoulder width except that it appeared thick chested. He described its covering as being more fur than hair and that it appeared neat, not matted, and its fur appeared dark with a reddish tint or highlight. The witness described no facial features and no visible neck. The creature was described as having stocky lower thigh length arms that swung when it walked. He described its gait as long striding and that it seemed to pick up its feet or legs proportionally higher than a human would. He stated that the legs seemed proportionally shorter than humans with respect to its height. Realizing this was not a bear, but some unknown creature, the witness was not interested in investigating the area for tracks, but more in vacating the area without haste. Finally, the witness spoke of conversations with a fellow hunter, an old-timey Florida cracker, who had told him of seeing four to five foot monkeys walking on two legs in the green swamp. This contact is being actively pursued by this investigator. Habitats within the Green Swamp River system includes a mosaic of cypress, hardwood, and pine flatwood forests interspersed with sand hills and wet prairies, along with their associated fauna and flora. These habitats are replete with food and water resources that are fully capable of supporting populations of large game animals, including deer, hogs, and bear. Wildlife management areas within the Green Swamp maintain these populations through regulated seasonal hunting. This witness was participating in this wildlife management at the time of his sighting. 
There is no reason to conclude that this habitat could not support a small population of Sasquatches, and this report was nothing but supportive of that hypothesis. Late at Night A True Story by Alex Michael, Chief Editor of Animal Watch magazine. Bow Valley Provincial Park, Alberta, Canada, 1996. My family has always been notorious for doing things at odd hours, and as you well may know, the strangest things always happen late at night. It was an unusually warm autumn some years ago, and at 16 years of age, I had just finished a summer job as an arts and crafts camp counselor. The only thing left to do was pick up a rather large trunk filled with my belongings. Unable to fit such a large trunk inside the VW Beetle I had purchased just a few weeks before, my mother was volunteered to transport it from the mountains back to the city in the larger of the family cars. Summer camp was a very wild place for me, with staff partying every night until the wee hours of the morning. My room was near the entrance of the staff residence where all these parties took place. By late July, sleep-deprived party wimps like myself were weeded out. So I built a single mattress-sized platform in the woods and then covered it with polyplastic. It was a 15-minute walk through dense forest to get there from the residence or the road. Bow Valley Provincial Park, an undisturbed protected forest, was only a stone's throw away. It's there that my mother, a small dog named Willow, and myself were going to retrieve my trunk at 3 o'clock on a Monday morning. Why 3 in the morning? I could say it was the heat, but it was mostly because my father had not yet been told that the car would be leaving town. There was also my adolescent fear that knowledge of the platform construction would somehow reflect itself in a summer paycheck I had not yet received. My mother had to be at work by 6.30, so we had less than an hour to complete this covert action. As we approached the highway turnoff, a sliver of the moon cast a glowing border around southwestern Alberta's Mount Yamneska. Driving several miles along the gravel road, the camp looked deserted. Summer staff had cleared out several weeks before, and a handful of permanent staff were either taking days off in the city or asleep in cabins several miles from the summer campsite. Angling off on the side of the road, my mother left the headlights on, pointing into the trees. There was some discussion about taking the 20-pound dog named Willow for protection. However, Willow's track record for wandering off severely threatened a successful completion of the mission. Plus, very uncharacteristically, the dog named Willow refused to get out of the car and was now partially hidden under the driver's seat. Car headlights were of no value after the first few seconds of meandering through the forest. We had a flashlight, but I was having difficulty remembering the exact location. The 15-minute walk turned into a 30-minute skin-scraping bushwhack, but finally we arrived at the isolated platform, even though the flashlight batteries were now dead. I assured my mother all that needed to be done was to take down the polyplastic rain cover and carry back a mattress and the trunk. It should only take two trips. She was noticeably silent as we began working in the darkness. My mother began untying strings, securing the poly to the ground, and I was kneeling on top of the four-foot-high platform. Stretching up to reach some tangled binder twine knots tied to a tree, a pungent smell suddenly flooded the air. My eyes moved from the knots to the tall length of plastic. There, distorted through the semi-transparent poly, was a huge shadow only about seven feet away. With the four-foot platform and me kneeling on top, the creature was easily at eye level. A split second later, there was an incredibly loud, screaming roar. Although I know of nothing to describe it, the sound was like a peacock scream, a bear growl, and a lion roar, all somehow combined. I can't tell you if I screamed, I can't tell you much of anything other than my eyes continued to peer through the plastic at this massive shadow. My five foot three inch tall mother had somehow leaped into the air and was now on the platform beside me. Whatever it was finally turned and walked slowly away on its long hind legs. We continued watching as each heavy step could be heard contacting the ground. There were no visible ears, just a sparse mohawk-like fringe sprouting up from the tapering top of the creature's head. From behind, the upper body appeared massive. It continued to walk upright until disappearing into the trees. We stayed on top of the platform motionless for some time after. Then finally, I started ripping down the plastic. 
I have no idea what my mother did during the next 40 or 50 seconds, but the next memory was power walking through the forest. Balancing a single mattress on the top of my head with one hand and carrying the handle of the trunk in the other, I assumed my mother was holding up the other end of the trunk. With Willow still hidden under the driver's seat, it was a very quiet drive home. Late at night, they say your mind can play tricks on you, but I am so certain. Brown bears had been in the area that summer, but I have never seen a bear walk upright that smoothly or for that long a time. Or it could have been a very large, long, furred man standing over seven feet in height. I say man because intuition tells me that the creature was a male. Could it have been a Sasquatch that night? I will never really know for sure, but you can bet that I will keep telling the story as if it were. Alex Michael September 1993, near Nordegg, Alberta Hello, my sighting took place at a little camping site called Camp Alexo, west of Rocky Mountain House, east of Nordegg. The sighting took place when we all decided to take a walk one night. We all headed down a hill past the boys' cabin. We came to a set of railroad tracks, turned left, and started heading to an old cemetery we were told about. We found the cemetery, and we all explored. Some of the graves there were from the 1800s to the 1900s. After about an hour, it started to get dark, so we all decided to head back. As we were going back up the tracks, we all of a sudden heard one of the girls scream. When we all turned around, we saw her flashlight shining up on this old tower. I wasn't ready to see what I saw, and to this day, my hair stands on end when I tell this. But on top of this tower, which itself was about 40 to 50 feet high, stood this creature. When we all shined our lights on it, it proceeded to jump off this tower. When it raised its arms to jump off, you could clear as day see the hair hanging from its arms. But what gets me is how it could jump off this tower like I was jumping off a one foot high curb. After it landed on the ground, it took off into the bushes. We could clearly hear trees breaking as it ran away. All of a sudden, there was silence. Then about a minute later, there was this loud, eerily high-pitched scream that just went right through you. Investigator Adrian Erickson spoke with two of the witnesses. I talked to R.C. and I.B., who were both 16 at the time, and I feel both are credible. I talked as well to the manager of Camp Alexo, who says that there have been several sightings in the area over the years, and in fact, in 1988, Renee DeHinden came out in the spring and investigated reports in the area. As I am quite familiar and have worked extensively in this area, I investigated and discovered that the tower was in fact wooden cribbing along the railroad that was originally used to load coal. And that, depending on where the Sasquatch was positioned, that it likely jumped between 20 to 25 feet to the ground. R.C. was impressed by the size, but the first thing he noticed was the hair on the arms, and added that it didn't appear to have a neck. Thanks for listening. If you've had an encounter or sighting of a Sasquatch and would like your story told here, please email me, Lynn Smith, at BigfootCaseFiles at mail.com. I'm looking forward to hearing from you.